So our next speaker is Dr. Corinne Riddell. She is Assistant Adjunct Professor of Biostatistics at UC Berkeley. She will speak about her research using epidemiological methods and data visualization to examine racial inequalities in health. states have virtually eliminated the gap and other states 
have done a lot of forks. So in the previous data that I had, that data that was um, publicly avail available to me, I looked at 40 states, and I put it in quotes because it was 39 plus DC. Um, I had 45 years worth of data. To calculate life expectancy, you kind of have to um, break down the data into age groups. So we have these 19 age groups, two genders, two races for these. Again, that'll be expanded for the new data request. And then I broke, I looked at specific causes of death. So at the end of the day, the rows of data corresponded to combinations of these strata. So the way that the data looked, my previous request was like this. So I had a row of data in particular for Alabama in 1969 for black men well, here, black infants, and I looked specifically at CBD. So on a death certificate, your death is coded very specifically, and then I could take those codes and put it into one of the cause of death groupings. And then the data was actually missing because it was publicly available. If the count of deaths was between one and nine, then they wouldn't tell you because it's too identifiable at that point. So it was missing but I knew the denominator, I knew how many infants there were at that time. So this is kind of what the data looks like that I'm dealing with. The new data request, it won't be aggregated like this. I'll have one line of data per person and then we do this kind of aggregating uh, for ourselves. And we won't have any missing data because we'll have the, the restricted. Um, and then the modeling I won't talk too much about. But basically, we use some Bayesian statistic models to um, smooth the mortality. And that was mostly to do some estimation to take care of the fact that we had these missing data. But also, for certain states, there's very small populations and often very small black populations. So then you want to borrow strength across your multiple years of data. OK, so I think I'm going to stop that bit of it, but I want to show you what I like to make at the end, because this affects, again, how I do the computation. So I tend to make um, these apps. So these are made using R um, and the Shiny package. And so they're just really, it, it takes like user input. So for example, you can hit Explore State. We can pick California. It'll update in a second. The first thing you'll want to know is like how the population has changed for these different combinations of race and gender, and you can see that here. And then it'll show you the trends in life expectancy in California. So you can actually see California is one of these states that the gap in life expectancy has not changed very much at all. Um, there's this blip in the data, which was this coding error on the part of the death certificates that we dug into, separate story. Um, and then you can go down, and this is where I'm doing the partitioning. So what this shows you is, so in 1969, the gap was like four and a half years for women, similar for men, 4.7 years. This is partitioning that gap into combinations of age groups and <coughs> causes of death. So you can look over here at the legend, and so when you look at this, what it's showing you is this huge spike, so this is infant mortality, the contribution of infant mortality to the gap is almost exactly a year in 1969. Um, and most of those infant mortalities are coded as all other causes because infants aren't dying of, they're not really dying right of cancer and cardiovascular disease. They're dying of other things that are code, coded as other here. Um, you can see this huge contribution of um, CBD for women, cardiovascular disease, uh, in the age groups you expect. Um, in terms of when people die of CBD. And then you can compare what went on in 1969 for women to what went on for 1969 in men. And immediately your eyes probably drawn to blue, so you can see this, this kind of contribution of injuries. Um, and then you can do the like year to year comparison as well. So these are the sorts of things I make. I just want to show you another state just to give you an idea of the differences. So we just quickly remind yourself of the gap, the change in California. And go look at New York. So that gap is going from a larger starting point, about six, to about zero. And when you look at what's going on and what still contributes to the gap today, we have a little bit of infant mortality, and we still have CBD. So that's really the basis for the difference. And then this bar to the left of the line 
is saying once you reach 85 years of age, the mortality rates are lower among black women than they are one, among white women. And there's a lot of um, controversy in the academic field about like why, what's going on, but to me what I see is, is in terms of who's dying of cardiovascular disease, it's a shift in timing of when these deaths occur. Um, and so if people are dying, if people make it to age 85, there's a difference in like who's still living at that time and what they're dying from. Okay, so that's like a lot of background about the type of research I do, and I only have four minutes to talk about computing. But I think that's okay, because we haven't actually done any computing here, but we're getting it set up. So in terms of like the computational stuff, I just need to compute life expectancy and do this partitioning of the gap. These are demographic techniques. They're not very intensive to do, if I'm running the Bayesian models, those things take a lot more time um, and are a bit more intensive. We're not sure what we'll be doing like on the statistical front, what sorts of models we'll be right, run, running, but they might be intensive. But I have this PL1 data, so that's the classification for data that needs to be a little bit secure. Um, then, and it's like kind of Berkeley's designation for data that needs to be secure, but not too secure. <coughs> So this PL1 rating goes from PL1 to PL2, PL3. PL3 is the most secure. PL0 is like you can store it anywhere, and mine's classified as PL1. So I need to put it somewhere that's safe. And I need it to be in one place that like me and my students can work on. Um, I use R in our studio, and I don't wanna just send like batches of data somewhere and get output. I wanna interact with the data, I wanna see the visualizations and the plots, it's a hugely important part of the type of work that I do, both for myself, because it helps me catch errors in how the data is coded, um, but you saw the sort of things that I make, like they're highly visual. Um, so I, I really need to be able to do that, which means I need to use our studio um, to see what's going on. <laughs> so this is what's been proposed. So I've been actually working with Jason and Chris Hoffman, um, and this is the solution so we're going to have a Windows virtual machine that will be set up in this analytics environment on demand. And so that environment will have this yeah, virtual machine. It'll run R in our studio. Uh, that'll let both me and my student have access. And it's designated to, to, to store this level of data, PL1 data, that I have access to. Um, and so we're hoping, I think we have like a lot of hopes that this pilot project will be successful and we'll be able to have other researchers at the School of Public Health um, use the same system. So there's a lot of us in this similar situation where we use data, and we, need to, it's, we need to store it in a secure way and we need to have a system where like there's computing power. And so there's a lot of like, I guess, new faculty in the School of Public Health that has similar needs. Um, yeah, that's all kind of ended there. Uh, questions for Dr. Dell while we transition to the next speaker? Was there a specific reason you chose uh, deaths rather than like healthcare access? Yeah, so the reason yeah, the reason that I chose deaths is because life expectancy is kind of one of these barometers of overall health. And so it kind of aggregates across the life course how people are doing. So if life expectancy is higher, um, the people are doing generally better. And so you can look at these disparities. Whereas if I looked at life or healthcare access, then that's kind of a determinant of health, right? So I think that is really important. Um, but my first step was this descriptive step of measuring overall health. But the next step is to connect it to things like, okay, is New York doing better because they have better healthcare access or maybe different specific state policies that vary between New York and California. Yeah. Did you look at other alternatives for doing your computational work? In terms of like models or like we no, the doing? actual uh, place where you were going to be doing the computation. <laughs> Jason? You know, Jason knows much more than that. You know, we, we, we're in discussion. We also looked at our, you know, thinking about using our high performance computing solution on campus. 
but as Dr. Dell's showing, like her work is very visual and interactive, and so then it's more convenient to have a GUI and you know a, a display. Whereas with with our high performance computing solution, it's a sort of um, submit and and wait for results. You can't kind of tinker uh, throughout. So um, that's where we are. Is that Windows VMware um, hosted on campus, or is it somewhere else? Um, it is hosted on campus okay. in the in the data center. Okay. And it's um, it's. Um, so it's not cloud. It's private. Well, it's yeah, cloud it's not cloud. cloud. It's the private cloud. Right. Right. So it's VMware. The back end is VMware and Citrix. Mm -hmm. The UC Berkeley's IST information um, department. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's all I got you. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Thank you. Well, in Britain, we are also looking at uh, VMware capable of running here or on AWS.